me share my screen. Uh, one person share screen. Come on. Okay. Here. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, Bassam, you want to start, Bassam? So we're going to talk this time about reviews of V sub five, the cerebrovascular. The problem with the cerebrovascular disease is not much like the aortic, not much like a clinical scenario. It's just more, mainly is data and decision making and uh, guidelines. The reason why we reviewed that about three weeks ago. Hopefully, guys, you still remember that because most question and answer will come from the guidelines. So we'll see. We'll go through them and we'll see how things go. Uh, but Sam, you ready? Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. A 60, 68 years old man underwent carotid stent placement for severe asymptomatic left internal carotid artery stenosis five years earlier. Surveillance uh, duplex imaging suggests moderate to severe instant restenosis. The potential benefit of free intervention in this case is. So um, we are talking. Yeah, we are talking about uh, a previous uh, uh, stenting, carotid artery stenting. Uh, five years ago, and the uh, follow-up duplex showing uh, intrastent stenosis. Correct. And, and patient is asymptomatic. As he was asymptomatic, yes. He's still asymptomatic. He didn't mention any symptoms. So we resume is asymptomatic, correct? Yeah. Okay. You remember what the guideline? Let me put it back. So let me let me go here so we can get benefit. Yeah. Is a slide here. You see my slide, guys, on the screen? Yes. Okay. Well, let's go to the guidelines here. Uh, let's say about redo. Where is our redo? Uh, surgical technique, surgical. Here, after redo. Well, this is what they said for re-intervention after current endotomy outstanding. So yeah. what they said here, if you have a symptoms, and you have 50 to 19% stenosis, then to have, you have to redo the carotid or re-stent it, okay? If yeah. that usually less than 50%, they treat it medically. If patient has a carotid circ in anatotomy and asymptomatic 70 to 90%, then they want us to make multidiscipline team review to decide should we do it or not. But if he has a stent, and he has a resource more than 70% and asymptomatic should be treated medically. Okay. Why is that? Because if he has a carotid surgery, you can redo either redo surgery or re it. But if you have a carotid stent, re it is not good because it is already small artery with another stent. And go with surgery be very difficult because you already have a stent, so you cannot remove it. You have to do a major surgery. The reason why in carotid standard, if you have re stenosis more than 70%, patient asymptomatic, you have to leave him alone and medically. If he has a symptom, it's different. If he has a symptoms, then most probably you have to re stent him or do a surgery, but most probably re stenting because when you stent him first time, you presume the patient's high risk. So if you're going to redo a surgery, it doesn't make sense because he's still high risk, you know? So most of you need to re stent him. So we re stent him only if he has a symptom if he's asymptomatic even even as high st degree stenosis the guideline to see to set set to treat him medically okay okay the guideline so just review it very quick so you can remember that so let's see what the question said um uh option a improved long-term stent patency with a high rate of uh, perioperative neurological events uh, improved long-term patency and neuro neurologic event rate with use of covered stent. Uh, uh, improved, yeah. Uh, so we can get benefit because we're not trying to solve the question. We need to try to learn. Yeah. Uh, 
improve long term, beta and C will not improve beta. That is why we don't redo them. You know, it's high rate of operative neurological event. It's yeah. not, you see, when you do redo, so when, when patient got three stenosis, is most, most, most probably is intimal hyperplasia. It's not yes. a plaque. Atherosclerosis, yes. Of embolization is much less. Yeah. So really is not higher rate for your body. Neurological event, I think, be the same or less. So this is wrong. Yeah. Uh, improve long beta and C with use of cover stent. We do not use cover stent at all in the carotid okay. stent. Except yeah. if we have aneurysm, you know? This is uh, well known. So this is completely wrong also. Yeah. The third one now. Uh, improved long-term patency and neurological event rate with drug eluting balloon angioplasty. Uh, we do not use drug eluting balloon also in carotid. In carotid, yes. Yeah. No, with the effect of you know flushing all this material to the brain. So we yeah. do not. So this is completely wrong also. Sure. No impact on patency or long-term stroke rates. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, best when stent excision and carotid interposition grafting is performed. This is very extensive procedure for this patient, yeah. Who's asymptomatic. Who's asymptomatic and uh, to start with, uh, he underwent stenting. That means uh, he's not fit for uh, surgery. So we will also, so I will choose D, D. no impact, no enough, uh, maybe there is no enough studies uh, 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 to decide about patency uh, uh, or long-term stroke rate. No, yeah, this is, is the most suitable. This is correct, this is correct. But, but this is what the reason why recommendation came from because they found, they know they have a study and they yeah. found no impact on patency or long-term stroke. The reason why they said, if you have a high-grade stenosis, understand, leave them alone, Treat him medically if patient asymptomatic because study show there's no impact on patency on long term stroke. So, this would be our answer, you know. As I said, this is the problem with the cerebrovascular is all just data. It's not much to think about case or something like that, you know. So, you just have to study and read it. It's very good. Thank you, Sam. Sure, thanks. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, who is that? Amjad? Amjad? Yes, hi, Dr. How are you doing? Fine. Uh, so this is a 70 years old uh, man presented to the clinic with an asymptomatic 80% right internal carotid stenosis. He has uh, congestive heart failure with an ejection fraction of 10% and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease requiring two liter of oxygen. He is non-ambulatory and uh, lives in assistant living facility. According to his cardiologist, his uh, protected life expectancy is two years. His stroke risk is, so give me a patient is uh, asymptomatic, severe stenosis, 80% with a lot of comorbidity, uh, life expectancy of two years. Uh, his stroke risk is. Well, before before we go there, let's just look at that. You know, uh, first, I mean, in your exam, you can see a lot of question about asymptomatic heart stenosis. Yeah. Why? Because this is where the controversy is. Nobody mm -hmm. argue about chronic heart stenosis. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a question. Mm -hmm. Very simple. So the reason why you're going mm -hmm. to see a question about asymptomatic. This is where the controversy. And the guideline keep changing about uh, asymptomatic carotid stenosis, okay? Mm -hmm. So 80%, so significant stenosis, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's the intervention. We can see only two years, you know? Mm -hmm. Remember, if we go to the recommendation from, you know, from ACAST, which is asymptomatic carotid endotrochotomy trial. It's five years, yeah. Uh, you know what their study is the life, you know, the long term. I mean, what the uh, length of the study? It's uh, a five years. Five you years, know? yeah. I remember five years, yeah. Five years. So the only mm -hmm. time they came with a recommendation that they said that patient more than 70% or even mm -hmm. 60 on the study, they said you need to do cardiac This is 1995. They were talking about when, when they follow up this patient for five years. 
less than five years, their phone is no different, no benefit. To get a benefit, patient has to live at least five years and more, you know? Yeah. For minimum two years, but not less than two years for sure, you know? Mm -hmm. It was five years. So if you only follow up with this patient for two years, they found there's no difference between surgery or medical treatment, you know? So mm -hmm. anyone life expectancy less than two years, we cannot apply the ACAST, you know, recommendation on these patients, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For this patient, what do you think need to be treated or not? Not treated. Not treated, correct. So treated, mm -hmm. not, not treated, but not surgical treatment. Or not standard. surgical, medical, yeah. Because life expectancy is two years, you know? Two years, yes. Second thing, if you remember from ECA study, all done on young patients less than 70, you know? All people yeah. more than 70, they notice that they will not benefit, if are asymptomatic, will not benefit from surgery or stent because they think that more than 70, your life expectancy is not very high. You know? Mm. So all the recommendation was for 70, and when they study, they did study 70 and younger, you know, patients. Mm -hmm. uh, where symptomatic is the opposite. Symptomatic, they get more benefit when they are older, you know, 70 and above. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a recommendation that if patient 70 and above, you recommend even surgery, not stenting, because stenting high high chance of stroke because of the nebulization from the, our, from the aortic arch, okay? So mm -hmm. this is the guideline, this is what they said, okay? And mm -hmm. if you, let's go back to the guideline also. We are already here. Let's see where's the slide. Let's go back to the slide. If you go to the guideline, here, asymptomatic, correct? Yes. The slide, life expectancy more than five years. This is the first, mm -hmm. before you look at the other things. So if patient cardiac stenosis, asymptomatic, 60 to 99%, First thing has life expectancy more than five years and has favorable anatomy more than one, you know, suggest mm -hmm. high risk to, to decide surgery. But mm -hmm. if it's less than five or he doesn't have these features where we talked about it before, then would be medical treatment, okay? Yeah, yes. Let's see what the question now is. Let's go through the uh, answers now. Okay, A, significantly lower by carotid and astrectomy, no. Significantly lower by carotid artery stenting, no. Significantly lower by endostrictomy and stenting or uh, stenting, no. Uh, no, uh, uh, no statistically significantly lower, not, uh, not statistically significantly lowered by uh, carotid endostrictomy or carotid stenting due to the patient uh, projected uh, abbreviative lifespan. This could be, yes not uh, statistically significantly lower by optimizing the medical, not by optimizing the medical management of his congestive heart failure. I think it's D. Correct, yeah. Because everyone is other is off. Last one is wrong because they improve with the medical treatment, you know? We, yeah. we didn't do no treatment, it's not outstanding, but still you have to treat him medically, you know? Yeah. So they benefit from optimized medical management and his congestive heart yeah. failure also. Mm. Very good. Excellent. Who's with us? Ahlam, you are with us? Let me see. Yes, sir. Okay, Ahlam, you take the next question. Let me see. Here we are. Let's see what is that. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, uh, he's um, a 71-year-old man is referred for ACE and asymptomatic 70 to 80% right internal carotid artery stenosis. He is fit and active and currently takes uh, aspirin and atorvastatin. That is, uh, the, uh, the asymptomatic carotid surgery trial demonstrate the benefit of surgery over expectant management in this patient because, so 70 asymptomatic, se uh, 70 to 80% right internal active fit. So... <clears throat> So this one, according to the ACA study, which is ACA trial back 1995, they said he will benefit from surgery, right? Yes. So, yes. You know, he, he's, he's fit. And he's 71. Yeah, I mean, uh, 70 is a level because these were the seven and they say 70 and below. Well, let's, let's see what the question said, you know, let's see what the answers. Let's start okay. with the, so this demonstrates that the benefits of surgery due to, first, the risk of a stroke, um, 
at two years is nine uh, percent of sur uh, with surgery and twenty six with best medical treatment. Well, let's stop at uh, this. This one is stop at this one. All right, as I said before, the ECA study was for five years. Okay, so this yes. is a this question. I mean, it's hard to remember these numbers, but this is from the studies. You know, yes, it's just nine percent with the surgery, but this is after five years. So risk of stroke, uh, stroke at five years is 9% of surgery and 26 in medical treatment. So if they break you this question with a five years, then this will be the right answer, okay? Yes, but this is two years, okay. Right, so uh, remember, done for five years. So anytime you see two years, it's wrong, okay? Okay. okay. So let's go next one. B, age and fitness predict adequate life expectancy to benefit from prophylactic intervention. No prophylactic intervention. Oh. Hello? Yeah. Yes. He is fit, right? They tell he's fit. Yes. It's very clear. Yes. Yeah. That means he will benefit, you know. If he's not, 70 is, as I said, is a big age for the trial, but because they said fit and active, this then, okay. that means he's, he's, you know, he, he can benefit. Fit for surgery. Yes, then I will, I will offer him a surgery for this guy if he's fit and, you know, uh, okay. because the trial showed that, you know. Mm -hmm. Hello. Real life is different. You see, question comes from the book. It doesn't mean this is what you do in real life, you know? Yes. And, and this, this is visa five is about two years ago, you know? Now change, now they said you have to look for risk factors, other risk factors we talked before, you know? Mm -hmm. So but the question in the exam also you have to go with the most like basic, what the book says, you know? What the trial says, you know? Uh, okay. But if I, in my clinic, I get patient like 71 or 78 percent. If he's active, I may have to look at other things. How's the black looks? You know, I look at the other risk factor. How's the contractor? You know, a carotid looks. You know, so. But as a book said, as a trial, this yes, this guy will benefit from surgery. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Aspirin and statin agent can be discontinued after successful surgery. No. Aspirin and statin after surgery. No. So this is wrong. So even if we do a soft dose in the patient aspirin and statins. And the reason why these patients, they don't die from stroke. They mainly die from cardiovascular event. So you want to give this one to prevent cardiovascular event, you know? The reason why, even if you carotid, you still have to be an aspirin and statins, you know? And, and even now studies show that if when you do carotid, uh, when you look for carotid stenosis as a surveillance and you pick up a carotid stenosis, not because you want to prevent a stroke, because when you find a cardiac stenosis, it triggers your attention that patient has a vascular disease, so you start on aspirin and statin. And this has decreased his cardiovascular event, really, and death, more than decreases the stroke, you know? Okay. That's why you have to continue that even after surgery, okay? Yes, yeah. Uh, the risk with surgery is randomized, in randomized trial is cardiac and not stroke. What I remember, it's a stroke, uh, death and uh, stroke death and MI. Correct. This is a new, a true, a new trial. When what they talk about ACAST, is this the ACAST? You know, it's 1995. You see, we are a surgeon. We just look at the stroke. We didn't look at the cardiac. You see, when the cardiology came on the board and start advertising for stenting, they start looking for the cardiac because they want to balance the high risk of stroke with the stent. Then start talking about cardiac and all the things. But ECA studies, they talk mainly about stroke. You know, they were looking only for stroke. So in the my trial, <clears throat> the main risk was a stroke, not the cardiac, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, the absolute risk of stroke in asymptomatic patient is four times greater in medical treated patients. Asymptomatic, no. Yeah, it's four times as much. It's really only two times, you know? Yes. Stroke and asymptomatic patient is usually 50%, it's about double, you know? Uh, stroke and asymptomatic patient is, you know, absolute risk in asymptomatic patient, greater than medical, yeah. And medical treatment, risk of stroke is about 12% in five years. Medical treatment only, and surgery 6%, so almost double, not four times. So this is wrong also. All this okay. often. So, so two times, okay. okay so what you'll be answering? So the answer that the surgery, the benefit of surgery over the uh, expectant management would be age and fitness predicted adequate life expectancy to benefit from prophylactic intervention. Oh, excellent, very good. All right, let's go with Sam. 
Let's see what's that number four. Okay, Sam. Are you there? Anything. Are you on? Sam, I can't see the questions. So. I can see. Why is that? Let me see. Only you or everyone? Yeah, yeah. Now, now I can see it. Yes. Maybe just lagging, you know. I can see the question. It's apparently clear. You can see it now? Yes, yes, sure. But Sam, you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, a 72 years old man with an, with an asymptomatic 70% right internal carotid artery stenosis identified on duplex and confirmed by CT arteriogram after workup for neck brewing. The absolute risk reduction of prophylactic carotid endarterectomy compared to Best medical therapy is. Okay, so we have 72 years old. Again, we go asymptomatic. You see, all question about asymptomatic. 70% yeah. asymptomatic, you found carotid stenosis, you know, absolute risk reduction. This is uh, people really who argue against surgery or stenting, and they use this one very often, you know, that why need to do what's the risk reduction? Or if we do a surgery, how much we decrease the risk of? Uh, stroke per year, and if you do a surgery versus medical therapy, you know, uh, you have to remember the numbers. Can you guess? I mean, hard to remember, but can you guess? Um, you absolute risk reduction of prophylactic compared to best medical therapy. Um, like, thematic 70%, 72 years old, and we want to do a surgery, right? Yeah. Uh, when we do a surgery, how much we decrease his, if we do surgery versus medical treatment, how much we uh, decrease his per year, you know, versus the, medical The stroke rate with uh, the stroke rate. And is about 6%. And uh, by medical treatment is about 12% or something like this. That's so correct. almost 50%, yes. No, but this is in five years, remember? The study was five years. Yeah. 6% in five years. So how much per year? Per year. Six divided by five. How much you get? Uh, yeah, yeah, one fifth. Yeah, one, two percent. That's all what you get. Two percent. Okay, I put some money. Patient, is that tell you? Patient live only two years. He just decreases his risk two percent. Doesn't worth it, you know. To to do him through yeah. or stenting, you know, versus medical treatment. So that mean eight ninety eight percent of you're going to do ninety uh nine eight ah uh, ninety eight patients. The only two patients get benefit, you know. Yeah. So, the reason why all people with asymptomatic. We don't recommend surgery because really to get the benefit, you have to live five years or more, you know, to get like six, 7%, you know, reduction. But if patient live or two or three years, only one, 2% per year. So I get like 3% benefit. It doesn't worth it, you know, to put them through yeah. surgery because you have to look at the risk of the surgery and complications, you know, and anesthesia complications. And this is what the medical people argue always, you know, against surgery. The reason why we don't get many referral from neurologists because neurologists, they know this data and they don't think that surgery really helped much because they said one, 2%, unless the patient is young and it's symptomatic, but if patient asymptomatic, this is all asymptomatic. We're not talking about symptomatic. Yeah. Then uh, risk reduction, only one, 2% per year, you know? All yeah. right. Uh, so 50%, so, no. Yes. So other options, yeah. Yeah, think, approximately one to two uh, percent per year risk reduction for surgery versus medical therapy. Yeah, mm -hmm. according to our discussion, this is the answer. C, right. uh, approximately 17 percent per year risk reduction of surgery versus medical therapy. This is too much. Yeah. Uh, annualized uh, stroke risk reduction depends on aspirin use. Not really. Yeah, number needed to treat, uh, to prevent one stroke is nine. Not really, it's more than nine because again, it's only one, two percent, you know? So almost you have to treat, you know, to prevent one stroke, you know, you need to treat almost like 95 patients, you know, to prevent one stroke. 
uh, the reason why it's not one out of nine. So again, yeah. I mean, what do you want to learn from that? If asymptomatic patient, you know, really to get that benefit, he has to have a life expectancy more than five years to see major improvement between surgery and medical treatment, okay? Okay. But this number is numbered because medical people use a lot of neurology when they argue about against surgery in asymptomatic patient, of course, you know? Okay. Thank All right. What time is now? Okay, let's keep going. 2%, yes. Uh, now I can think to talk about it here. Number five. Uh, Amjad? Ah, uh, Dahman. I forgot Dahman. Mohammed belongs us, right? Yes, sir. Hello. Hello? You can hear me, Victor? I can hear you. Why don't we become a question? Yeah, yeah, you jump me to the sun. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 55 years old male with no significant medical history seen in the hospital for a middle cerebral artery uh, disruption and cerebral vascular uh, distribution, yeah, uh, and cerebral vascular accident. The addition of high dose statins uh, to his medication regimen will, <laughs> will produce a reduction in on, overall stroke and cardiovascular event. Five years overall mortality, five years. Well, let's go one. Mortality. Let's go one by yeah. one. Just okay. to tell you, you add, you know, patient 55, asymptomatic, and you want to treat him medically, so you give aspirin. And why we add statin? Is what I to tell you. Uh, yeah. the, that again, this is nothing to guess about it. It's a trial, you know, called a sparkle trial. You know, they look at that and they found a decrease uh, overall stroke and cardiovascular. So you have just have to know the, as I'm saying, this question, you just have to know the trial. They yeah. found, of course, not only the stroke, with had statin, it decreases the stroke and the cardiovascular, you know. Yeah. Uh, five years more that is not more different than you know. Uh, they found it's no different. Uh, cardiovascular mortality was no different also. Hemorrhagic stroke progression, not like a major increase. The duration of neurological symptoms is no different. Um, not much in this question, really. You just have to know the trial. Uh, but this is the advantage why we add statin to the aspirin, because they found in this trial it uh, decreased your uh, stroke and cardiovascular event. Okay? Um, so not much really about this. Uh, get an exam, you have to know what the trial said, you know. Uh, you know Why we give statin. Okay. Even now, there's a new study came out like a couple of weeks ago. They said statin is useless, but I don't know how strong is this study. They said it does not benefit anything, even cardiovascular. Okay. All right, let's take next question. Yeah, maybe this one's better. Okay, an 84 year old man represents uh, presents with a congestive heart failure, ejection fraction is 15%, and chronic COBD on three liter home oxygen. Double X ultrasound sound performed for a brewery demonstrated more than 70% uh, stenosis of the right internal carotid artery. He endorsed no signs or symptoms of stroke, transient ischemia, or amaurosis uh, of GAC. Uh, the most appropriate management includes among this patient is, uh, is multi, uh, yeah. So uh, he has multiple disease, and uh, it's the same question we discussed earlier, multiple disease and uh, asymptomatic stenosis. So usually these patients, they will go to uh, this medical therapy, I think. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you're correct. You want to be confident. Mm -hmm. Very obvious. I mean, an 84 first mm -hmm. guy, mm -hmm. you're 60. Mm -hmm. Already has COBD, home oxygen. 
Okay, so it's two against mm -hmm. and more seventy percent, and he has asymptomatics. You know, and mm -hmm. some people are being presenting, but this is not what the guidelines say. So some people say, totally, you know, we can do a heart stenting, but it's not the guideline. The guideline is that because this guy's life expectancy is on five years. Because eight he will not live five years, you know? So because life expectancy lasts down five years, then I don't think he benefit from anything, even surgery or stenting, you know? So this one, I will put him on for best medical treatment, you know? Well, let's see what the option said. Go ahead, Hamad. Right, uh, carotid endarterectomy with batch angioplasty under GA. Uh, transfemoral carotid stent placement with, with intracerebral protection device, transcarotid arterial revascularization and carotid stent, uh, stent placement, D non operative management with medical optimization. I will choose D. Uh, e right carotid endarterectomy with batch angioplasty with local anesthesia. No, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. D is, uh, obvious. is there any difference in uh, patient selection between local and general doctor or anesthesia, no. I mean? No, there's no difference. Yeah. Okay. The general and uh, local anesthesia. And the guideline didn't, uh, because the patient high anesthesia for uh, general anesthesia, you can do the local, you can do stenting, you know? Um, Yes. Right now. But this, okay. this, in this patient, is not a question. Is that you can, because again, you can do a stent. I mean, not the problem is anesthesia, because you can do a stent. We're not, we're not declining his stent because of, because of his risk of surgery, because of life expectancy here. You see? This is the reason why we, we're saying no. You know? Like, if he is like, if he's like 55, even if you have COPD, we may consider, okay, tell me, I can, because his life expectancy, even COPD, 55 years old, you will live long. 85, COPD, and home oxygen, his life expectancy will be less than five years. So there's a reason why we, so it doesn't matter that any seizure, we're talking ma mainly about life expectancy. Sure. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, Ahlam? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Number seven. Yes. A uh, 77 year old man is referred with duplex ultrasound finding 70 to 99% stenosis of his right, uh, right internal uh, carotid artery. The finding uh, are symptoms most consistent with symptomatic carotid stenosis as. Okay. Intermittent dizziness and vertigo, recent onset of blurred vision, recent uh, episode. Huh, sorry. Let's stop. We have to learn how to just solve the question. Okay. No, I want to read it all first. No, no, no. It's okay. Simple. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, first, intermittent dizziness and vertigo. Uh, in old age, it's not yani, the only reason the carotid stenosis. No. There is a lot of differential diagnosis. Intermittent dizziness and vertigo. It is anterior or posterior circulation? This is uh, posterior. Posterior. So this is nothing to do with the crowd. This is something to do yes. with right? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is dizziness and vertigo is a sign mm -hmm. of posterior circulation. This is not, so a lot of patients we get referred to us because of dizziness and they have a carotid stenosis. We should not consider as a symptomatics. This is asymptomatic because dizziness come and vertigo from posterior circulations, you know? Yes. Unless if patient has like different severe stenosis, let me, let me tell you like this scenario, which is important to know that. Let's say patient has 90% asymptomatic carotid stenosis and he came with a vertical, all right? And he has like 10% vertical stenosis. This one I'll do and fix his carotid because if he has his circular force is intact, because this will increase blood flow to the brain and will increase blood flow to the posterior circulations, you know? So in this way, I will get two benefits. First, I fix his carotid and I improve his circulation to the posterior, you know? I will not go to his vertebral artery, you know? But if the carotid are normal, then we target vertebra. But patient with a, with a posterior stenosis, with a 
vertigo and dizziness, uh, even the symptom in, from the vertebral artery, but if he has a severe cartilage stenosis, we prefer to fix the cartilage stenosis first, you know, because most of the time this will improve his vertigo, especially if it's intact, you know. But it's still, vertigo and this is, is not a sign of carotid, internal cartilage stenosis. You know, it's a question they tell you, is the symptoms of cartilage stenosis? Is dizziness and vertigo? This is wrong, right? This is a vertebra. This is yes. a operation. Okay, so this is wrong. Uh, recent, recent onset <clears throat> of blurred vision. Okay. Also now. Uh, let me see. Now why is a cartilage stenosis? Cartilage stenosis, what's the symptom of cartilage stenosis? Uh, it, it could be like uh, ophthalmic TIA. Yeah, this is blurred but, vision, right? This is a blurred vision. This is a TIA, this is ophthalmic. This is a okay. mural, but this could be, correct? Okay, yes. <clears throat> okay, then we'll see a recent episode of right arm and hand numbness and tingling. Yeah, it could be, like there is a subclavian stenosis. Not right. the... No, let's go, let's go slowly. This is as bad internal cartilage stenosis, right? Yes. <clears throat> numbness and weakness in the arm will be right or left arm? Uh, it will be the same arm. In the cartilage stenosis, he has a right arm. The other arm, carotid stenosis, uh, other arm. Correct? So be the yes. left side. So if patient yeah, has yes. stenosis, you get the symptoms being the left side. For the arm and left. For the eye, will be in the same side. So the eye will be the same side, but the uh, weakness will be on the other arm, okay? So this size has a right cartilage stenosis. That means the arm weakness will be on the left, correct? Yes, yes. So recently, because of the right arm, this is wrong because it should be the left arm, correct? Yes, correct. A brief a period of vision loss in the right eye. Yes. Yes, could be. Because the right eye, the same positions, right? The same uh, location, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, residual left arm weakness from a stroke 10 years ago. Uh, residual left arm weakness 10 years ago. This is very important here. A lot of patients come to our clinic, okay? And he has it's like this one, 90% stenosis of the right internal carotid artery. And he has an MRI which showed he has a stroke on the right side like 10 years ago. Is this guy we consider symptomatic or asymptomatic? We should consider asymptomatic. Why is that? Because when we talk about symptoms, when all this trial we talk about symptoms, they talk about recent symptoms, like within two weeks, you know. If the symptom more than two weeks, we don't consider symptoms anymore. So patient come with a uh, left or right intercartic stenosis and MRI showed an old stroke in this area, we don't, we still consider this patient asymptomatic because the symptoms to consider symptoms has to be within the last two weeks, you know? So, so this patient left arm weakness from 10 years ago is not a symptom of carotid stenosis. It's not, it does not tell you he's asymptomatic carotid stenosis. You get my, you get the point? Yes. yes. Yeah. You're right. Um, or I mean, not sorry, not two weeks, sorry, six months, sorry, six months, not uh, two, two weeks, two weeks, we have to do a sorry, it's in six months. So any symptoms less than six months, we considered an asymptomatic. More than six months, we considered asymptomatic. So if he has a stroke 10 years ago, then he's asymptomatic, okay? Yes. Uh, so we'll go back again to that question. So what the symptom of cardiac stenosis, internal dizziness and vertigo, no. Recent onset of blurred vision. Okay. And then the left, you know, if it's both eye, blurred vision, it is not, you know? If you just tell you like one eye, the same one you said, like in D, vision loss in right eye is specific, then yes, this is from the right internal cartilage stenosis. But the blurred vision, like in general, in the question, they didn't say right or left, I will consider both, and this is so not symptom of cartilage stenosis, okay? Okay, sure. So it's D, brief period of vision loss in the right eye. And the left arm weakness, yes, left arm weakness will be on a stroke if he said like within three months, yes. But madam, because he said 10 years, this is more than six months, then we cannot consider it as symptomatic. Okay? Sure, yes. 
this is very important, okay? So this is just to know what the symptom. So the most thing consistent with this patient as a symptomatic, because he has a vision loss in the right eye. Okay? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, who's next? Uh, let's go with, uh, I got lost, uh, who, Amjad? Let's go, Amjad. Yes. Number eight. Okay. 75 years old man presented to the hospital with a new onset shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, and uh, electrocardiogram, ST segment elevation. He is offered a coronary artery revascularization for left main coronary artery disease. He has a concurrent asymptomatic 80 and 60 uh, versus sinus of internal carotid artery. Uh, the correct statement regarding the outcome uh, for carotid revascularization consisting of a symptomatic coronary artery disease. So he wants to ask about the indication of uh, uh, intervention for carotid before cabbage. Correct. Right. So before cabbage, the main mm -hmm. controversy until now, the, the main question is what the cardiology asks you is that should you do it before, with after. the cabbage or after? Mm -hmm. Should you do it or stent? This is four or five questions. Before. Yeah is after surgery versus stent. Mm -hmm. okay. What do you get the guess? First, we do prefer surgery or stent for the before cabbage? What do uh, you think? Logic. It's okay, just give any answer. Don't worry, if it's wrong, no big deal. What do you think, surgery or stent? Uh, before surgery, we'll do stent because the patient will be in dual antiplatelets. Uh, will, not, will be a stent or not? Before surgery, if he's indicated? Before cabbage. I mean, what, if before cabbage, if you want to give patient an option to treat his cardiostenosis, should we treat him with a stent or surgery? 50-50. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just um, thinking why I will choose. I think I will uh, I'll choose. Uh, if you think about it, Amjad. And I'll check to me. Why not stent? Stent is easier because he already has a, he's, he is a high risk, right? He's high risk for surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need a cabbage. Mm -hmm. So really, mm -hmm. you're right. It's correct answer. But I'm just telling you how to think, you know? So you mm -hmm. think a stent would be better because it's less you can do in the local. It's no risk because he already have an ST elevations, you know? Mm -hmm. But the problem with the stent, the more you put a stent, then he has to be an antiplatelet at least for six months. Yeah. No way you can do a surgery with antiplatelets. I mean, nobody yeah. knows surgery, you know? Yes, yeah. But as a cardiac surgeon, you know, if he can wait, you know, for six months, then yes, I mm. mean, then because it's less invasive, less risk. But if he cannot he go with surgery now, then he had to go with the surgery. And this patient has ST elevation, so he cannot wait, right? He has shown no mm -hmm. breath. So yes, he cannot offer him a surgery, okay? Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. Second question mm -hmm. is that, should be done the same time before or after surgery. Uh, what do you think is the best way to do it before, after, or during the same time with the coronary artery, same surgery? Either before or with the cabbage, not okay. after. Not after, because after is increased risk of stroke. Yes. Uh, all the commission they used to say do it the same, but they found that the stroke rate is really higher for using the same. So now most recommendation had to do it before the cotton. Yes, if you do them together, it's increase your mortality and stroke, you know? So uh, now- Sa Samir, can I say- Yes. Uh, I think the key points uh, here in this question are two. Uh, revascularization of left main coronary artery, which is an urgency. And the other point is the carotid stenosis is asymptomatic. 80%, but it is not asymptomatic. I think, I don't know, but I think uh, who's uh, uh, asking this question, uh, he want to say that when you have left main and asymptomatic carotid stenosis uh, with ST uh, elevation, go to uh, revascularization of the coronary artery, which is important, which is more important. Uh, and, or you can make it in the same session if you, uh, not a staged one, uh, I think to put a stent in, in a patient like this, and if he has uh, a bradycardia or anything like this, you will uh, go for 
problem with this uh, with this uh, patient. Uh, to do the the carotid before the left main, I think it is uh, risky. So if it is asymptomatic, 80%, the other 60, and left main, I think we can uh, bypass the 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 carotid problem or, or the, the carotid stenosis and to leave it to other to another session and to uh, focus our uh, intention, our interest on the left main. What do you think? Yes, I, I agree with you 100%. But when I was reading the questions, here's the answers, you know, I know that it is not what they want, but I agree with you 100%. The reason why I didn't talk no, no, we are discussing the question, not the answers now. I'm discussing only the question. What are the key points of this question? Yes, this is a guide. Let me show you the guideline. I agree with 100%. This is a guideline said, yeah. if 80%, I will leave him alone, as you said. Yes. Uh, let me see. Here. Left main. The uh, problem is it is a left main. Here, let me show you. You see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. A neurological asymptomatic cart, this is before cabbage, okay? Patient, this is measure of cart stenosis in patient undergoing cabbage, okay? If asymptomatics, protein prophylactic drug to me in patient 70 90% is not recommended. Yeah. See? I agree with 100%. The only thing you have to do, only time if he has bilateral, 70 to 90%, or 70 90% on one side and contralateral occlusion. Yeah. So this to, is what I what I said. Yeah, I agree uh, totally. He does not need it, you know. So I mean, the problem is that whoever this question, maybe this is an old question. They didn't read the new guideline, but this I agree, hundred percent. Yes. I mean, at this patient, I will leave him alone. I would say yes, just do and go and go with a cabbage. But then yeah, this, I will focus on the left main. If it is, it was lad, uh, serk, or right, or uh, but the left main, I think it is. So risky to to waste time, uh, yes. or to do anything that may uh, may give you a risk in this uh, operation. That's correct. But I think what they want to ask the question. But I'm saying they, the way they phrase the question is wrong. That what they want. When I read the answers now. Uh, I noticed that what they want to tell you is that I'm saying they put that question in the wrong way. Is that should we do it before, during, or after procedure? Well, what do you prefer, uh, Ali? Uh, I think for this patient, asymptomatic, yeah. one side, and left main, I will leave the carotid and I will send the, the patient to the cardio surgeon and I will leave the carotid for uh, after. If okay. it was symptomatic, we will discuss it, I think. Well, this I'm saying, the question is wrong, but the one to tell you, ask you is that if your patient need carotid surgery and cabbage, should we do it before, during, or after surgery? This is a question. Forget about this question. The way the way I do, if it is not left main, I yes. do in the same time. I do the carotid, and our colleagues of the cardiac surgeons do their cabbage. Or my, or, uh, we are we standardize this uh, this uh, uh, this approach. Uh, so we have no problems. We have no. Uh, I think that Martin once uh, also. Uh, talked about this, I think, uh, one month uh, uh, ago, if you remember, when he said that they do many carotids uh, with the, the cardio surgeons. Uh, I, for these patients, if it is not left main and it is not symptomatic, I will uh, leave it. Okay. So what I understood that if patient needs a surgery cabbage and he need a carotid... Simultaneous. Synchronous. Synchronous, yeah. This is I my... start with the carotid and then they go with the uh, with the cabbage. This is the way I always yeah and always with a patch. With a patch, yes. I agree. Oh, yeah. This is the way I used to do it. Yes, I go first, start. I do my carotid yeah. and that I do a patch, and then I don't close the wound because they give heparin. Yeah, it is right. We close the wound at the end. Yeah. I come at the end. I close the wound after they give heparin. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Same way. Yes. But the problem is that, as I'm saying, I mean, this is our practice, but the question is that was the data show, you know, data is, I'm saying, data is different what we do. I mean, this is for the fellows, you know, the data for some reason showed that if you do surgery, uh, uh, carotid cabbage and carotid endectomy at the same time is increased risk of stroke. So one, now they want to do it before surgery. But again, I mean, you have to individualize the patient. As you said, patient like this one left main, it's his major problem. I don't think anybody will, will agree to put him under anesthesia to do a surgery and listen to do it under local, yeah. you know? So, Annie, you yeah. have individual... But it is a stress. It's, but, it's but still it's a stress. stress. And if it is a local, it is stress for the patient. Yes. 
but for the for yeah. this, well, let's go through the question and say what the what the answer said. Uh, let's go, uh, Amjad. A A stated related and astrectomy and the original or local anesthesia first, followed by coronary after the vas grafting, is associated with the highest published preoperative stroke rate. Yes. Uh, yes. Stop on this one. You see. The, the, yes. the publish I'm saying is I'm saying it's different one me and Ali we talk about what real life but what the published data showed no it has the lowest reparative stroke rate you know uh, yes. data, but I usually and the reason now I have a very difficulty with a cardiac cardiac surgeon to do it the same now in our hospital they refuse to do them at the same time they want us to do the cut it first and then do a surgery because of this data you know even though I trained the way, like Ali, he said, I trained to do them together, but now I'm getting a lot of resistance from them. And they said, you have to do it before. And this is the way we, I do it now, you know, and they have to manage his very, very operative, you know, risk, the cardiac risk. So again, so the data showed, no, it has a lowest published record. So this is wrong for the fellows, okay? No, highest published preoperative stroke no, rates, highest. The highest. Followed by the current, no, they found this is the lowest. This is the right answer, I think will be. Uh, which one? Abby. Let me see stage current talk to me or occur first, followed by the coronary artery graph associated with the highest. No, this is wrong. This, yeah. They found it has the lowest published part of that stroke. That's the reason why they want us to do the carotid first and then the cabbage. You see, this is what the data said. Yeah. Okay. So this is wrong because that doesn't have the highest published. You know? Okay. Uh, okay, next one. How does the artery stent placement under local anesthesia followed by coronary artery by vas grafting is associated with a highest published perioperative stroke rate? This is stenting after the same time stenting. I think the same, strong also. No, not really. I mean, a stent before also is lowest, but the problem with the stent, as I said, is the aspirin and plavix. So you yeah. cannot do the answers. Okay. But, but they want to do it in the same time that I understand it from the question or to be followed they need as second stage. Uh, talk about B or C? B. B, they said to do uh, stent first, then the cabbage. Okay, second stage. B. Yeah, okay. Um, C, uh, stimulously carotid and artery and carotid artery by vas grafting is associated with the lowest mortality. You say this is the correct one? Uh, not really. Yes. Not really. You know what I'm saying this data showed the opposite. I don't know why, but this was a data sheet. They, they said it's the highest mortality if you do them to others. And the reason why now the cardiac surgeon finding with us with this new data, you know? Mm. Uh, uh, so they said no, it's the high, highest mortality if you do them to others, you know? Okay. Uh, so it's ahead. the opposite. The coronary artery by vascular grafting followed by carotid and the is associated with the lowest published preoperative stroke rate. You say after it will be high, and no one will do it after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, stimulus carotid uh, and coronary revascularization associated with the highest mortality. So it's supposed to be E. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, um, I mean, I don't, I mean, this is the, the right answer. It looks from the data, but. Um, Again, I mean, I will individualize the patients, as Ali said, Dr. Ali said, and we go patient by patient and you discuss with the cardiologist. Uh, but if patient high risk for surgery, I still think do them together, I think is, is better. But, uh, but if for, for the exam, this was a data short, you know. Uh, but maybe it will change, you know, always, always data change every while. But this was that last data short. All right, any question before we move? Ali, anything to add? Uh, I agree with E in this case. In this particular case, I agree with E. In other cases, no. I In this particular, because it is left main, I agree with E. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank Let's you. Go Bassam. Bassam, is go number nine. Yes. <clears throat> uh, a 45 years old man presents with uh, an asymptomatic more than 70 percent internal carotid artery stenosis and history of coronary artery disease hypertension and disease uh, requiring hemodialysis the outcome for 
كاروت ريفاسكولايزيشن ان بيشنس ويز اند رينال دي رينال ديزيز ديمونستريت ذات سو اي 45 ييرز اولد ميل ويز اسيمتوماتيك مور ذان 70% انترنال كارد ارتستينوز ويز اند سيرجينال ديزيز So what they're doing, so what the question is that do you think that endocrinal disease should we make you change your approach to this kind of patient? Do they put the patient at higher risk of stroke or same risk? Uh, in general, any patient with endocrinal disease is high risk for anything. So increased risk of anything. So yeah. the problem is that not much data about this, this studies. Nobody did a big study, all like small published data. But all data showed that, not all data, the published data is showed that if you have an endothelial disease and cardiostenosis, you have a high chance of stroke. So maybe you have to be a bit more aggressive with this kind of patient. But if you go to the guideline, nobody mentioned anything because the data is very weak, you know. So yeah. I think leave it to the individual patient to decide. But if you want to go with the exam, this was the data, at least the published data showed that if you have endothelial disease and cardiostenosis, There's a high chance of stroke, so you have to be a bit more aggressive with this patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at least they the question on and answers. So uh, mm, it is unjustified. Uh, no, it's wrong. Stroke risk is decreased. Um, no, I don't think so. Increase. Uh, Yeah, stroke risk and increased asymptomatic high grade stenosis is not treated. If not, this is wrong. If not treated, yeah, increased asymptomatic high grade stenosis if not treated, and, yeah. and uh, uh, carotid endarterectomy uh, is associated with is associated with higher perioperative stroke risk. Carotid artery stenting is associated with a higher perioperative stroke risk. So what they want to do to tell you that, I mean, first surgery and stand the risk preoperative stroke is the same, doesn't matter. So this will not increase your instead of stroke. But the only thing they found that if you left him eight, uh, if you, not, you don't treat this patient, because asymptomatic 70%, you have tendency not to treat him, right? From most yeah. of what we think. Yeah. So here they want to tell you that if it's patient renal failure, you may have to be aggressive and treat him because stroke rate they found Yeah. Then this patient asymptomatic is higher than normal patient with asymptomatic 70%. But again, I mean, it's not strong data. So I will just individualize the patient. There's no guideline, I will individualize the patient. But for the exam, this was a data showed that your stroke increase if you have asymptomatic carcinosis with the renal uh, insufficiency or renal on, based on dialysis. Okay? Yeah. So like, the answer is C. 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 Yeah. So stroke increase, risk is increased, uh, uh, is increased as like high grade stenosis if not treated. If we don't treat him, it's high chance of stroke. That's why we have to treat him, you know? Okay. This is a soft data, soft evidence, you know? Uh, again, guys, remember, whoever put this question is a person. So we could be wrong, if we change it, but, you know, I mean, even if you answer this question wrong in the exam, not a big deal, because I don't think it's a strong data to do that. And if I tomorrow, if I get the patient with more than 70% stenosis and renal insufficiency or in dialysis, I may not change my approach. I'll maybe just watch him. I will not do surgery unless it's a really good reason to do a surgery because the data is not very strong. But okay. you just try to put the questions because, you know, they have to put the questions. But uh, again, this is what it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What is that here? What is that? Somebody writing my screen? Anyway, uh, let's go to, it's almost yeah, nine. Let's go to last question, 10. So don't keep you for a long time. Hopefully it's a nice question. Okay, let's go that. Who want to finish it? Uh, look at Ahlam. Yes, sir. Uh, in patients with carotid artery stenosis after neck radiation, a comparison of the outcome of carotid endarterectomy and car carotid artery stenting demonstrates. Okay, first of all, after radiation, we will have unusual uh, stenosis. Uh, we have difficult plane for the surgery, high risk for um, nerve injury. So mostly stent, not surgery. 
So let's see the option. Uh, first, higher pre uh, procedure stroke rate for stent. Well, let's, let's stop. Hypertrophic stroke rate for stent. I mean, really, the stroke rate will not change, you know, if you have a or not. In general, really, even I think it, uh, the instance of stroke after cardiostenosis from radiation is lower than normal patient with uh, cardiostenosis. You know why? Because radiation causes intimate hyperplasia and damage. We don't see like a plaque, the same what we see the, the atheroma in atherosclerotic disease. Okay. Mainly is intimate hyperplasia. So you see a smooth, you know, uh, a smooth stenosis in the internal uh, common carotid artery and in the, in the internal and common carotid artery. So when you when you balloon it or stent it, really the chance of, of embolization is very low because uh, the pathology is different. It's not an atheroma that can break that loose and go to the brain. But this doesn't mean that you should not use a brain protection. You still have to use a filter, you know. But the stroke rate is the same if you have a radiation or no radiation. So this is be wrong, okay? Okay. Uh, higher uh, myocardial infarction and this rate after uh, for uh, endotrectomy. Uh, I don't think so. The same. Yeah, everything is same. The only difference will be what the nerve damage really. I mean, yes. the difference in stent is not the stroke, it's not the mortality, it's not the thing. It's only the nerve damage should be higher if you do a surgery. But anything else will be all the same really. You know. Because, uh, you know, the, all the studies showed that when you compare CAS with like CA, with a cardiac endotrectomy, if you look at the stroke, MI, and this was no different. You know, the reason why they approved the CAS. But in this scenario, the only problem will be that you have more nerve damage because of the radiation. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, C, uh, higher pre procedure uh, stroke, MI, and death rates for uh, endotrectomy, no. Okay. Uh, Equi uh, equivalent pre procedure struck MI death for both endotrectomy and stenosis. Yes. Uh, superior long term latency for a stent compared to the uh, endotrectomy. Latency, uh, no, it's uh, the same, but the complication, it's more with the surgery. Correct. So it's no, it's no different. It's no different. The only is different, as I said, is uh, nerve damage. There's no different between MI, stroke, and death, you know, uh, between both cardiac surgery and stent. So the only reason we do it for radiation, not because we decrease the MI or death or stroke, but because we don't want to cause nerve damage, you know, because high yes. chances. All right. You did great, guys. I think we passed the Thank one you. hour. Sorry, guys, to be a little bit longer. Uh, we'll meet next Tuesday. We'll finish. I mean, the, I mean, sorry. This subject is a bit like more like uh, rigid and uh, not very interesting, like the award because not much that, not much like scenario. You have to think about it. It's just more data, and but you have to know about it because you get out of question in the exam like that. This is what they love to get you question like that in, in the in the exam. So you have to read about it and be familiar with the data. And mainly asymptomatic cardiostenosis, guys. Always review asymptomatic cardiostenosis. There'll be a ton of questions about it, you know? All right? All right. I think, I think Samer, uh, yes, Ali. it is good now after this uh, discussion to review your slides on the uh, yes. uh, guidelines that you did. The last, uh, Samer, if you, if you can, we can, the fellows will fix more the, the, the ideas that you uh, explain. If you can uh, put your slides once again, the last slide, I think, about the guidelines, I think it is useful in this in this moment. Yeah, which one are we talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah. about the redo. Just, just to fix, yeah, just to fix the ideas that you you said. Yes. Just well, I'm trying. When every time I have like you know something related to question slide, I'm trying to put the slide back so you can look at the the guidelines. Yeah. Uh, we talk about the cabbage, we talk about it, you know, most of you have more questions later on in the rest of the questions. We still have, I think, 30 questions. Most of you have to go back to the guidelines, you know, this will help us a lot, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for your input. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. And we'll meet next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Okay, enjoy the rest of the night. Take care. Okay. Thank, you. Bye. thank you, Dr. Thank you, Robo. Bye.